This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett and today I'm joined by Mr. Tony Black. How are you, sir? Mr. Tony Black. I am very well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, doing doing good, Duncan. How are you doing? I, I trust I got that right. <laughs> That uh, you did, you did. It's important I, to get these things right. Yeah, absolutely, you know? Pro- pronouns are are key. Absolutely, and uh, yes, I I would identify as uh, he him definitely. So um, the world of pronouns has, has changed a lot, hasn't it, over the last few years? Actually, since probably since we um, we began primitive culture, there's been a lot of changes, haven't there? Really, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, actually, and it, and it's an interesting one. Um, we are once again opening up the sanctuary, uh, Tony's podcast from um over on the we made treks podcast network a few years ago uh for an episode which you called originally accidental representation i think and it's a it's a very interesting topic it's kind of looking at the issue of lgbt representation in star trek um but the lens you were approaching it through is the kind of accidental trans stories essentially that happened in the 90s trek era where i don't think anyone was really intending to write about trans stories, but they sort of kept touching on them almost accidentally when they were trying to do uh, sort of LGB stories. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting topic. And it's also another one of these ones where Trek has moved on even in the time since you recorded that um, back in the first uh, lockdown. So I thought it'd be an interesting one for us to have a little chat about and then um, let the listeners hear the conversation that you recorded before. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think there have been a lot of steps and you know, it, it's, it's a, fa- it is a fascinating and ever evolving topic. There was, there was a conversation in my workplace recently about, uh, how the list of, of actual, uh, representation letters continues to grow. So in, it used to be LGBT and now it, then, then it became LGBTQ. Then it was LGBTQIA, I think. And I think there've been a few other letters added on since. And that, that's, and that seems to be a regular thing now. And it's, as these as these these things develop and it's it's a subject i think a lot of people feel a little bit anxious about tackling because it is a very sensitive subject and it can be dealt with in with a, a great deal of well a lack of care shall we say if it's not approached properly and i think what what interested me was w- how star trek had really started to represent this back in the days where they didn't really know what they were doing and and back in the days where the way of tackling this representation was extremely extremely in its infancy you know and whether or not it star trek could be looked at as being progressive as as progressive as it thinks it is i guess really in comparison to today where as we as we're seeing on discovery particularly they they are very acutely tapped in a lot more to that aspect of culture and that aspect of sexuality and and, and gender. So I it, it was just really interesting to go back and look at those at some of those episodes and see did they get it right, but also were they were their intentions in the right place? I guess which which is maybe more as much as the of the question really. Yeah, I mean I think 
Discovery is probably the Trek show, certainly since the original series, that wears its kind of woke credentials uh, as a badge <laughs> of pride, if you know what I mean. And, yeah. and I don't mean that in a dismissive or a negative way at all. I think it's fantastic. I mean, for many years, there was a real battle, wasn't there, between the creatives, you, you know, the writers who generally did want to, you know, for example, include uh, gay storylines or gay characters or whatever, and the producers. And to be honest, probably largely Rick Berman, um, who was standing in the way of that. And I think there was a real anxiety about it. I mean, one of the things that struck me is I think it's easy to look back retrospectively and say, oh, these 90s episodes failed in various ways. And in some ways, and and I think there's a legitimate argument that Star Trek was not as ahead of the curve as it should have been at that time. On the other hand, I think there was a curve and things, you know, were changing. And I don't know that it helps to be totally blinkered, um, to that reality, if you know what I mean. I'm thinking of something like Ellen, for example, when Ellen came out famously in her show in the 90s, which was sort of around that same time that, um, you know, DS9 and Voyager were on the air. Uh, I don't know how it affected her, but I know Laura Dern, who played the love interest, said her career took a massive hit, basically for agreeing to play a lesbian character in that, in that way. Um, so, you know, this was a time where people were anxious in Hollywood and they were, you know, um, gay storylines were not as acceptable to a mainstream audience as maybe they are now that, you know, Brokeback Mountains won Oscars and we're kind of more familiar with this stuff. It takes a while for the kind of mainstream to become more comfortable. I mean, even uh, actually Rejoined, another episode you talked about, I remember reading at the time Terry Farrell saying she found the kiss hard to film because she'd never kissed a woman before and she you know she just she found it difficult as an actress not to say she didn't agree with it or with with the storyline but like she found that uh challenging as a performer and I remember reading that back in the 90s and thinking oh come on that's a bit pathetic but actually you know I mean fair enough maybe if that's not your sexuality or whatever and you're having to perform something that's uncomfortable for you because it, it you know you can't kind of connect to it personally I don't know. I feel like it's a tricky area. It, you mentioned the host as well. Similarly, I always felt like like you and your guest both did, you know, come on, Bev, w- what's the problem here? <laughs> because it does seem quite sort of homophobic yeah. uh, or tra- you could say transphobic in a way, her uh, attitude. On the other hand, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, Tony, if your wife suddenly uh, not only transitioned into a man, uh, you know, as happens in real life these days, you know, people do have partners who transition. I think to assume that you were just not, even bat an eyelid and it wouldn't be an issue uh, might be a bit naive. And in that instance, transitioning into a apparently a strange person, do you know what I mean? An unfamiliar person. I, I'm not saying I don't think there's a problem with that episode. I, I kind of think there is. And it's the way that she's like so fine with it when it's Riker and so not fine with it when it's a woman um, that I think it reads that way. But at the same time, I don't know. I don't know that we can draw from that, oh, Beverly is homophobic or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I think it's it's it, it's a slightly more nuanced and more complex situation. But that is definitely a moment that these days reads very much as a kind of trans allegory because it is literally, you know, someone whose partner uh, changes gender um, and how they deal with that, which I think is an interesting topic that, you know, other shows more in recent years have, have dealt with. But obviously for Star Trek to be dealing with that, albeit somewhat accidentally, was uh, quite a bold thing to at least dip their toe in the water, even if they didn't quite work out what to do with it. Yeah, and and they did sort of come into it arse backwards in many ways, because when you look at The Outcast, it w- when Jerry Taylor wrote that episode, she wasn't at- intending to write it about transgender issues, which, you know, transgender wasn't even really a word in that way in the way it is now when that was when that was written in in say i think it would have been around 90 90 90, you know i don't think it was outside academic circles a word that anyone would be familiar i mean people talked about transvestites yeah they maybe talked about transsexuals uh very much in the mold of you know almost of drag do you know what i mean like that was the kind of language of it i don't i don't remember hearing the word transgender you know growing up i don't th- i think that would have been quite a specialized uh sort of discussion that was going on in quite rarefied circles if you know what i mean that you're right in recent years even in the last five years or whatever has become much more mainstream as younger people have kind of absorbed these ideas maybe through universities and so on and then spread them into the world i think yeah no totally you know it was it was absolutely drag it, that, that the uh, idea of the understanding of a transsexual or a, tr- or a transvestite came from 
you know, ridiculous, almost ridiculous caricatures on television. People like, you know, Barry Humphreys as Dame Edna Everidge or, you know, Lily Savage. And or they, like Quark they, in, uh, in um, Profit and or, Lace. yeah, you if you want to look awful, at, at a Star Trek yes, example. Which is, I'm not going to defend that. No, 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 exactly. <laughs> it was made in the 90s. That was a, ter- you know, that was a really terrible episode, even at the time. But um, yeah, well, they were, I, I think that's true. It's, it's, it's much more nuanced uh, conversation that goes on around these issues now. Yeah, yeah uh, totally. Because they were looking for a cheap laugh in that case. And in the case of the of the outcast, you know, which rightly wouldn't get on television now. But it, it, in the case of the outcast, Taylor was trying to do a story about homosexuality and tackle homosexuality in a way that then rejoined in its own way does try and tackle. And and we're, we're, but the, the problem with that one was it, when you when retrospectively you look back, it 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 almost felt like in some ways it went through the male gaze in that it was that you had Terry Farrell who was you know an attractive actress and it for a lot of the male fans watching it was more about the thrill of seeing two girls kiss each other than it was really getting into the 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 nuance of what that episode was whereas the outcast was was different in the sense and maybe a little bit more ahead of its time in the sense that well i'm in some ways in the sense that it was it was essentially about Riker falling in love with a transgender alien being however as jonathan frake said at the time it was undercut by the fact they cast a woman in the in the role and now if they remade the outcast say on discovery you would not have a woman cast in that role it would be you know a a a trans actor like blue del barrio you know it would be that kind of that kind of person and that and that's where on the one hand you might look back on the outcast and think it's dated and it's a little bit off colour, but on the other hand, they were trying, even if they didn't realise, they were trying to tell stories about gender fluidity at a time when it wasn't even a concept in the heads of lots and lots of people, like you say, outside of academic circles or within that subculture. So it, in that sense, it was maybe slightly ahead of the curve. Well, I think even, I mean, realistically, if you were a Hollywood casting agent in 1990, whatever, you wouldn't know where to find no. uh, a transgender or a, not, especially a non-binary performer I and mean, that's another term that just didn't in, in mainstream circles didn't exist then i mean interestingly i don't know i know you've been getting strange new world screeners this episode might have gone out uh by the time people are listening to this and i think they've actually posted about the casting but there is a trans uh actor who plays a non-binary character in the most recent episode that i've seen anyway of strange new worlds um and it's interesting because there it's not it's not relevant do you know what i mean yeah. like, it's totally like like okay they use they pronouns and but it, it it doesn't really have any impact on the story. Whereas obviously with those characters in Discovery, I feel it's sort of, I mean, we could talk about this. There's, it, there's, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, but by making it a story about the trill and so on, it kind of draws attention to it. And it's sort of an issue on some level, not an issue in like a negative sense, but you know, it's, it's something that is sort of focused on. Whereas by the time you get to this Strange New Worlds episode, it's just totally like, uh, you know, this character could have been male, female. And do you know what I mean? Any, it could have been, cast in any kind of way but they chose to do it that way um which i think is an interesting step forward i want to pick you up though on something that i've always wondered about you said that frakes made this comment at the time now i don't know whether that's true or not i know it's something that he says all the time now like at conventions and so on and i think that's great and it's a good point uh and it would have been very a bold thing to do to have that character played by a male actor back in the 90s i don't know that it's true that he was saying this, you know, in his trailer back in 1990, whatever. And that's not a criticism of him. It probably wouldn't have occurred to him uh, at the time. Uh, I mean, I'd be fascinated if someone can produce evidence that he did say this all that time ago, or even that he says that he said this all that time ago. I sort of wonder again whether that's us looking back with, you know, 2020s lenses. And it's a bit like when we look back at the original series and the gender politics there, you know, uh, not to say that we can't rightly critique a lot of that, but we also need to be aware of what the kind of cultural uh, landscape is at the time. And even for people who are, you know, who see themselves as being on the right side of history or or woke or, you know, uh, politically correct or however you want to define it, some of these things are kind of blind spots until you're introduced to them, which is one reason why, you know, representation is so important in these shows, because it does kind of normalise um, maybe unfamiliar uh whatever lifestyle, sexualities, gender identities for people who 
otherwise maybe don't know anything about them and you know in some cases are instinctively slightly alarmed or afraid or you, you know have these kind of negative reactions to them so i think it's really important um in that sense i mean i would say with the outcast i don't know if it works as a trans episode but like you say it wasn't intended to be a trans episode i think as an episode about gay conversion therapy it's really powerful i mean that section at the end is incredibly moving and dramatic and well written and it you know as a kind of star trek allegory i think it works personally I hear what you're saying about rejoined. And obviously in that kind of Burman era, there's always the element of (laughs) of the kind of male gaze and, you know, casting the babes and so on. And, you know, Terry Farrell was cast with that in mind to some extent. They changed the makeup because they wanted her to look more sexy and so on. Um, At the same time, I find that episode completely devastating every time I watch it. And I think, again, you know, some people say, oh, it's not really about two women because they knew each other when they were in a straight relationship. Well, yeah, that's true. And I suppose, you know, they could have, change that but they they wouldn't have changed that at the time and that was sort of their way around it do you know what i mean that was their kind of like you know like roddenberry's always set it in space and then we can talk about racism or whatever it is maybe they could have gone further but even so i feel like as an allegory about uh, a kind of love that is you know societally um looked down on and uh taboo and you know all this stuff it's a really powerful episode and a really moving episode i think when you start saying oh the trill about kind of trans identity it it does complicate it because that's certainly not what they were at least consciously thinking but then you do get those moments like your guest mentioned um the moment in blood oath uh with you know curzon my beloved old friend oh i'm jadzia oh but jadzia my beloved old friend i mean that is a weirdly sort of prescient uh moment of it's true just that like total non-issue approach to it which is very refreshing but i think it's i don't know i think it's it, it, it it's it's tricky with these issues like how to approach them. I think this issue of how to approach them has actually paralyzed Star Trek for many years. Uh, and you know, there were decades, well, not decades. There were, there were, there might have been a decade where people were clamoring for a gay character. I mean, before Gene Roddenberry died, he had promised to introduce a gay character and there were, you know, famously battles about, oh, who was allowed to be holding hands in the background of a scene in 10 forward and, you know, all this stuff. And he, he, was definitely pushing the more progressive agenda. And then obviously he died. And even before that, he was quite ill and, you know, n- not as involved. Um, and there was a much more conservative approach. And, you know, when Voyager launched, people were expecting a gay character. When Enterprise launched, people were expecting a gay character. And then it wasn't really until Discovery. I know we had Sulu in the Kelvin movies in that, like, three second <laughs> moment or whatever. But it wasn't until Discovery that they kind of actually dealt with it. And again, they dealt with it in quite a kind of matter of fact way, which I think was a a great way of, of doing it. You know, they were brushing their teeth. They weren't, uh, you know, having a big sort of passionate romance necessarily or, or, or like making a big statement. They were, a, you know, an established couple and they acted like any couple does together. So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I think I'm less harsh on some of those 90s Trek episodes because I think they they kind of tried to do something and maybe they should have done more. And certainly I think by the time of Voyager and Enterprise, they were kind of behind the curve and they should have been doing more. But, you know, next gen DS9, I don't know, I kind of give them a little bit more of a pass for at least being sort of interested in touching on some of these issues um, and, and producing often quite emotionally powerful stories that sort of allegorically touch on these things. And I do think that a lot of it comes down to is, you know, w- what are the boundaries of allegory or, or metaphor? I mean, like I say, in Discovery, if all Trill are trans, why is it, you, you know, why is it that the that the non-binary and the trans, you know, the two trans characters introduced are both involved with symbionts? You know, one is a Trill and one is a human who's effectively a Trill because she's got a, because, sorry, because they've got a, look, I just did it myself, because they've got a symbiont. Does that sort of, muddy the waters a little bit because it's like is this an allegory or is this just reality or is this do you know what I mean when is an allegory not an allegory it kind of raises this this uh question and I'm not saying that I think they do it badly I think it's quite beautiful the way they do it and that episode where uh Adira meets her past host really beautifully done um and that relationship between two of them is really beautifully done too but but I think it does sort of um I don't know I, I I can't decide whether whether deciding to do it through a trill story was a brilliant masterstroke or actually uh, 
sort of confused matters a little bit. And in some ways, like, as I said, this character in Strange New Worlds, who it's just, yes, okay, they happen to be a, a non-binary character and they happen to be played by um, a trans woman, is in some ways, it's a, diff- it's a different way of going, isn't it? It's a different form of representation um, without kind of the sci-fi you know trappings no no absolutely and and you know one one of the th- one of the reasons that i uh i really wanted to bring on a transgender star trek fan in orion armstrong who's the guest in this was because you know i, I searched on i canvassed on social media for someone within the uh lgbtq community for someone who you know loves star trek who would come on and talk about this because it, it seemed important to have you know if we're talking about accidental representation I, I yeah historically with star trek i wanted someone who could represent that lived experience now and be able to discuss it through star trek through that lens and uh, I, th- I think i think it makes the episode all the more interesting and and crucially valid in a way because although for the most part i'm not i'm really not the kind of person who thinks if you're not a particular either demographic or or you know expert in something that you shouldn't talk about it i don't believe that really in life and i think that's quite reductive however for something like this i think if if you are in that that community it's very i think it's very or if you're not in that community i think it's very hard to really truly understand the experience even if you work with people in that community as i have and still do actually in 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 some ways at some at some points it's so important, I think, to have that voice on this kind of discussion. And I was really glad that we got someone who was as good as Orion to do that. Absolutely. And I mean, that also is something that's changed in the, you know, decades that we're talking about. I mean, Terry Farrell playing a, a lesbian relationship, if you want to define it that way, uh, you know, at least ostensibly. Um, th- by the time of Discovery, of course, you know, you've got the the gay characters are being played by gay actors. I don't think they would have cast straight actors to play those roles these days you know that is the difference of again a a sort of um our consciousness has moved on a bit in terms of the those kind of issues and yeah you're right and you know we've just been wanging on about this for 20 minutes and (laughs) why should anyone listen to what we think or or, you know whether whatever i whether i think it works better to make the trans characters trills or not trills i don't know yeah you're right i mean uh it's absolutely important to center those voices um and those people who have, you know, more experience of these things. So with that in mind, uh, we will um, shut up <laughs> and we will open the sanctuary uh, to you and your guest and the great conversation that you recorded. Joining me this week for this episode is Orion Armstrong, a Star Trek fan from the East Coast and a member of the LGBTQ community, to discuss how Star Trek has tackled the political issues of gender through primarily the Next Generation Season 5 episode, The Outcast. So, Orion, it's really nice to talk to you. We've been chatting a little bit beforehand, so it's great to finally get a mic with you. Absolutely my pleasure. So, before we start talking about Star Trek... Uh, I hear on the grapevine that you're a little bit of a an artist, Orion. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you and what you do there? So I'm a fiber artist. I work with various types of fiber to create, well, art. I knit, crochet, I spin my own yarn, I weave, embroider, cross stitch, pretty much anything you can think of. Um, to keep it on brand, I actually make uh, Star Trek fingerless gloves. Excellent. So the different, you know, uniforms, you can even get it like, pipped and had the communicator stitched on so you know it's 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 a fun little hobby that's yeah become big <laughs> i want some of that <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to link to that in the show notes definitely because i want to i want to get my hands on some of that stuff fantastic okay well that sounds great that sounds really cool and we'll uh, we'll put a little link to to what you do uh, in our show notes and things like that but let's talk about what we're here to talk about then so for pride month in june uh, Jesse Earl's Nerd Out show for Pride.com put together an episode called Star Trek's Accidental Transgender Episode, um, in which the discussion was about the Next Generation's, as I say, season five episode, The Outcast, in which Will Riker falls in love with Soren, a member of the androgynous Janai species, who the Enterprise arrives to help in the potentially dangerous scientific discovery of null space, in quote marks. Jerry Taylor's script subsequently explores pronouns, gender distinctions, trans issues, and the thorny topic of conversion therapy quite some years before these conversations would enter the mainstream. 
Earl's episode gets into the positives and negatives of an episode which was never intended by Taylor to cover transgender issues and depict rather homosexuality in Star Trek, probably for the first time ever at that point. Jonathan Frakes commented at the time that by having Soren played by a woman, in this case actress Melinda Coulier, it undercut the homosexual relationship that was intended by the script. With hindsight, however, the outcast appears to be a little bit ahead of the curve in the conversations around being part of the LGBTQ community that are still being debated today. So just how has Star Trek approached LGBTQ issues and the community since the 1990s when these ideas first began to be explored within the franchise and the fandom? How do they align with the political standpoint of Gene Roddenberry's utopian future? And crucially, is fiction's most progressive futurism progressive enough on this issue? Let's start with let's start with your experience actually as a Star Trek fan. Before we before we talk about the outcast a bit more, so I mean, you you grew up as a Star Trek fan as 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 a as a trans man. How do you how does it speak to you particularly as a fan and beyond? You know, I mean, I, it's it's very interesting looking at an episode like the outcast and talking to someone in that community because I think it's really it it is really interesting to see whether Star Trek really does have those values that speak to to you. I I literally grew up on Star Trek. One of the first things I remember kind of designating as a child was I couldn't understand why Jordy I understood that Jordy that the, that LeVar Burton was the same person on say the Reading Rainbow show and as well as Star Trek. Yeah. I just couldn't understand why Jordy could see on Reading Rainbow and he couldn't see on Star Trek as a child. <laughs> so <laughs> So I, I literally like, you know, from my earliest days, I, I've been watching Star Trek and kind of growing up on it. And honestly, I would say that I really think that Star Trek has these values, especially when you first had Gene Roddenberry really very much involved in Star Trek's Next Generation. You can see those values that he tried to instill mm. into the show. And it's Star Trek has informed my values as an adult quite a lot. Um, as far as who I strive to be. And even as a trans man, it still informs my values. And growing up and watching that, and especially watching an episode like The Outcast, was just was just kind of, this is, this is part of who I am, and it's part of, it's okay for me to feel like I'm not X, Y, or Z. I can be something else. And that was a huge thing to be told as a kid. That, that's that's great. I would like to just preface a little bit what I said just then in that I I don't wish to for one minute suggest that being a trans man means that you should see Star Trek in any way differently or have a oh, no, absolutely. Do you know do you know what I mean? I, I'm very aware that as a as a white straight man, I and with my level of privilege <laughs> and my level of natural um, you know, lack of understanding that you, people can be very clumsy about how they talk about these things and be well-meaning and, and at the same time make people feel like they're, they're different. And I, I wouldn't like to assume that one second that that is what I'm su- suggesting there. But I'm, I'm interested in that, that your approach, when you watch something like the art outcast, whether you see it from particularly the 2020 perspective, given the greater awareness generally about trans issues and LGBTQ and the community, whether it works, whether it, when you look back, because from someone from my perspective, it seems to talk about things that we, we weren't hearing any very, very, very many other places in the nineties. If at all, but I would mm. say it absolutely works. It works incredibly well. You can see where, again, the society that it came from kind of informs its approach. So Soren's discussion of femininity with Beverly for example, is itself clumsy and slightly misogynistic in and of itself because it's very traditional. And you would think that by the 24th century, they would have moved on from that. But again, this was created in the 1990s and there are certain concepts and things that the audience that was trying to speak to didn't yet have the vocabulary or the experience societally to process. So it kind of had to go from that direction, but given its limitations, it absolutely works. When I was watching and, you know, the scene where Riker particularly starts talking about pronouns and he says, you know, I can't call you it. That's really rude. Was a real moment where I went, wow. Okay. That that's just, 
they, that is that is talking about you know pronouns and and um, you know the the way that gender is is framed that is surprising and and I suppose it's good for Riker as a character actually to have a storyline like this because he comes across as quite a swaggering ladies man so to give him a role where he's actually having to confront an issue like this is it is I think really interesting as a choice it's a really good choice honestly it's it gives a lot more depth and care to his character because by this point Riker had been jetting off to Riser 3 on a regular basis <laughs> and, you know, yeah. playing it up with, with the ladies there and to give him kind of this greater awareness of these issues and to have him handle it so well. Even Jonathan Frakes handled it very well behind the scenes from what, mm. uh, from what I've read. You know, it, it was just a really good storyline for him all around. I, th- I think so. And it's it's something that you wouldn't necessarily think Riker would be able to handle as a character. But it, it, it's far better than a lot of the... You, know, you get a lot of really bad romance episodes in Star Trek. You know, I mean, we may well mention one or two of them later in this podcast. <laughs> but like... Oh, yes. But this one actually is quite good, even though it m- maybe it's less about believing that Will has fallen in love with Soren as a character and more about the issues that come out of that. I still think it's well done, and even though it's quite chaste. I felt like I came out of the episode feeling like it had made a real point and actually a little bit of an impact on Riker because he doesn't really... He doesn't really, by the end, he doesn't really fully discuss it, does he? It's more just something that is, that's happened, that he's got to, that he's got to adjust to. You know, the fact that Soren has essentially been con- converted in inverted commas and has had that horrible thing done to her. He he kind of has to just go go on with his life, doesn't he? Go off sailing on the starship again. He doesn't really have much of a choice. That type of conversion therapy is is irreversible and the person that he knew is effectively erased in a very meaningful way. I'm not saying that Saren was completely just, just gone. Obviously Saren is still there in a sense, but a very real part of her has been forcibly removed from her. And if that isn't a, a commentary on conversion therapy, which was actually very common in the 90s for people who were gay i don't really know what is that that's a huge thing for him to have to kind of deal with and process and and move on from do you think as well that i mean they've talked a little bit about and this is what jesse l talks about in that in that video that i mentioned in that it was never meant to be about trans issues and gender in this way it was meant to be a home a homosexuality story mm-hmm. and do you think that by by not realizing quite what they were making that it makes the episode a little bit <laughs> tone deaf like you know that it's it just does that do it a disservice in that they they wrote this with all of these things that they were actually exploring and they didn't even realize they didn't even know what they were do- <laughs> what they were doing like how? well honestly i mean as i said it's going to be a little bit tone deaf just in general, nothing can really uh, can really approach approach all it, all sides of an issue without being a little bit tone deaf to speak to a broad audience. There's just there's a certain amount of dumbing down that has to happen in order for you to have something to go out for broadcast to a nationwide audience. But I don't. I can see where they were coming from as far as trying to make it about homosexuality. Even today, there's a lot of conflation between gender and sexual preference. And I can Mm. see where that came into this here, where basically gender preference and, and sexuality and actual gender were kind of all mashed up together and thrown onto the deny and said, this is our, this is our monolith. This is our symbol. Let's throw it at Riker. And I suppose if you, if you, if you really break that down, what it's by, if they're saying that it's about homosexuality, they are suggesting, I think uh, you might disagree with this, but they are suggesting that Riker falls in love with 
a woman who looks like a man, a little bit like a man, and that in and in the end, even though she identifies as a woman, she is played by a woman, albeit maybe a slightly androgynous looking woman perhaps you know if you if you're going into the casting side of it that they clearly when they cast this they wanted they didn't want a prototypical femininity as almost like when Soren talks to Beverly Crusher about how she puts eye, eye, eye makeup on and all this kind of thing which is a sexy scene <laughs> yes absolutely and, but it's making the point isn't it that Beverly is more of the traditional inverted commas woman that you would you would you know you would imagine at that, that point whereas Soren isn't but Surely by suggesting that it's a negative in the fact that Riker might be attracted to a woman who looks like a man, that in itself is prejudiced. It's absolutely prejudiced. The whole point is to turn people's expectations on their heads. And I think the point was to get the audience to see Saren as a woman so that when she went through her conversion therapy at the end of the episode, it would strike home. And I think in that it succeeded, but there was very definitely a, this is a woman, this is a man, et cetera. And it, it, it is, I don't, I hate, I, I, hate using the phrase problematic without cause but it is somewhat (laughs) problematic that you know it was kind of played up as well Riker is falling for a woman who looks like a man what's going on it's like Mm. it's it kind of speaks to a inherent uncomfortableness we we have and had around gender presentation and especially in Star Trek where the women for all of their makeup, like even the Klingon women um, for a warrior race, you know, they have the armor, they have the, the forehead ridges. And I don't know if you've looked at Ursa and uh, Betor lately, right. but <laughs> they are very much, the boob window is very prominent. <laughs> so Now that does come back into my head, I have to say. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's it's very, they're very sexual, aren't they? They're very feminine sexual the way they're presented i suppose in a way that's why i quite like the char- t- character of laurel in discovery because she's not she's not presented in that same way she is presented in more of a, a an ambiguous sense i suppose in some respects even though she's a sexual character in some of the things she does in that in that in that series visually she they don't they don't make her look like lursa or Betel. you're absolutely right you know there there, there is a difference but you know what, though? That just shows how much we have moved on since the 1990s, that we can have a character who is feminine, who is sexual, who isn't this played up, like, um, minuet type character, mm. you know, who isn't there just for the sex appeal, you know, mm. like there's yeah. more to them than that. And for Discovery to do that is... It's just kind of a sign of just how far Star Trek and the society that is producing it has come. Yeah, and we'll we'll come back to Discovery a bit later because they 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 have they they are trying. They are definitely trying. But I think def- there is uh, there is obviously a level of conservatism about the next generation and, and sort of early nineties. Uh, well, all of nineties Trek in a way, as much as it can be quite liberal in places. There are you know the whole idea that that Rikers. Riker swaggering, you know, I'll cock my leg up on a on a screen. Masculinity is <laughs> is is challenged by the fact. Oh, maybe Riker is attracted to a male looking woman, you know, which is a really which is really crass when you look at it from that perspective. While at the same time, yes, he's, they're talking about things that are that are progressive, that are good to be hearing and talking about. And Soren's what Soren goes through is awful, and you really feel for her by the end, and you feel a, a horrible thing has happened. But there is also that flip, that conservative flip side, and I guess that comes out in Worf, you know, and 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 that that idea that he, I mean, I think Jesse Earl describes him as like the uh, the the the, un, the non politically correct granddad. <laughs> Worf goes through, and I, I don't mean to get us too much off the topic, but Worf goes through one of the most interesting transformations as far as character in all of Trek through from next generation through DS nine, just the growth of the character and the way Michael Dorn plays him is just kind of incredible. But in the outcast, he is very much the voice of, he's kind of the stand in Mm -hmm. 
for all of the conservative Trek viewers out there. He yeah. is their voice in the episode. <laughs> he is. And, you know, I, I, you, this is ultimately a, a politics, partly a politics podcast. And I'm not, I don't want to suggest that every conservative is prejudiced about sexuality and he's you know prejudiced about homosexuality and these kind of these kind of issues but because that isn't fair and that isn't necessarily true but i think there is there is a built-in there is def i think you're absolutely right i think there is definitely a built-in mindset of 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 wharf representing a section of the audience that sees things in a very black and white way and a very old-fashioned way in that these are men these are women these are what women do you know this is a women's role and and it is it is very old-fashioned man and I kept thinking, is this his? Is this because he's a Klingon, or is it just because he's he's just a bit prejudiced? <laughs> I, I think he's honestly just a bit prejudiced because I there's the episode where, and I can't pull it to mind, and I apologize. In DS Nine, where Dax meets up with one of their old Klingon friends from when they were Curzon, and. The friend walks up to Dax and go and hugs her and goes, Dax or Curzon, my old friend. And Jadzia says, well, it's Jadzia now. And his immediate response is Jadzia, my old friend. (laughs) So I don't think that, I mean, it's kind of hard to take one character as a monolith, but I definitely don't think it's because, because Worf is Klingon. I think it may be because he's just a little bit prejudiced. (laughs) Yeah, you may be right there, and, and like you say, he does he does have a transformation. He does go through a character arc. You don't, I don't feel like Worf at the end of DS Nine would would have that view. I don't. I don't Worf think at the end would, of DS Nine would absolutely not no. have said that. He throughout everything that he goes through throughout through the different uh, episodes, and I think especially with his spinal injury and taking care of. Alexander and going through all of that, that starts to be a turning point. And then getting onto DS9 and dealing with the trials of working on a space station through a war with, you know, with the, everything that goes on there. And I mean, there's a lot that goes on on DS9. Yeah. As well as falling in love with a trill who effectively can be, and even he handles that badly when Jadzia dies and come and Dax um, moves into Ezra or Ezri rather, mm. you know, even he handles that a little bit badly, but it's still miles and miles ahead of where he had been, you know, in season five of, of next generation. Mm. I think he certainly changes more than Riker does. I mean, I mean, while Riker is now, you know, now in Picard, we've seen older Riker and he's married and he's got a child and he's he's lo- lovable old Will now making his pizza and listening to his jazz. And and, and he's all, he was never he was never a horrible character by any means, but he was a very sort of prototypical masculine, her- heroic, straight white man. And, and that relationship he had with Deanna Troy is very much is very traditional. You know, it's a very traditional ro- old fashioned romance kind of story. So. In that sense, I mean, I, I always felt like throughout the next generation, part of the problem was you always sort of felt that they probably should have been together all the time, Will and Deanna. So whenever whenever the, either of them had a romance with somebody else, you know, there's even a scene in The Outcast where, where Will goes to Deanna and he sort of says, I don't know but if by telling you this, it's going to change us and our friendship. And to me, that's the writers almost nodding at the fact. And well, yeah, they, they're really probably going to be together by the end, you know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, so why why should we invest in in such a massive life changing and mind altering relationship as Soren? It feels like one episode isn't enough for Riker to get his head around quite what this experience is. In that he fell in love with a an a, a, an essentially a, a, a biologically asexual person who identified as a woman i mean that is huge and and he's his openness to that and his 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 ability to not judge and to love her for who she is is a big thing and i just wish i do wish they could could have had this kind of storyline happen now where you have serialization and you could follow oh yes you know it just feels like there's more I'm going to bring up one point of order where Soren is less, I think Soren is less asexual, more agender. Yeah. But, and that's just more of that terminology thing than anything else. But that's good. But Thank I, you. Thank I, you for saying that. Because that's, that's important. That is exactly, exactly the, what I was talking about, about clumsiness. clumsiness. 
<laughs> but I, I <laughs> that's completely fair. But I yeah. absolutely agree that the episodic format did not do this whole relationship any favors. This at least deserved its own miniature arc through a serialization versus mm-hmm. and I mean it's not that Trek didn't get serialized further on. It absolutely did. But this the episodic format that we had here didn't help the storyline any any to have something like this mm-hmm. introduced and wrapped up in forty five minutes to an hour is kind of doing a disservice to all of the topics involved. Yeah, yeah it is. And they, I guess they it just TNG wasn't a serialized show anyway. And the, I, I suppose they weren't, I mean, Star Trek hadn't, had always been quite sexually conservative in the sort of relationships that it portrayed. They, ne- they've missed, I mean, one of the things that you brought up when we were talking about what we talked about with this episode is they, it feels like that some of these 90s shows missed opportunities for LGBTQ characters, didn't they? There were certain potential avenues they just didn't go down. Well, of course there were. I mean, you had what the network censors and the network executives would approve. And those types of positions tend to be conservative by default because they have to consider what's going to make them money and what's going to appeal to the broadest range of audiences. And so it just, at the time, didn't make fiscal sense for them to push the envelope. I mean, for this type of episode, you know, the fact that it got released probably has a lot to do with the fact that it was released in the fifth season where Star Trek had just witnessed this, where Next Generation had just re- witnessed this resurgence of interest following um, following yeah. the best of both worlds, where that's really what kicked the fact that they might have to kill off Picard and that whole resolution that's what kicked Trek into high gear that's Mm. what made it Mm. big that's kind of what saved it and I think that gave them a lot more leeway to approach topics like this but even then there was only so far that they were ever going to be able to go yeah Yeah, they like you say they had they did have networks they did have executives they did have a broad audience although I've I have always wondered at the irony of mega conservative people who don't who aren't very progressive watching star trek i'm like why are you, why are you really <laughs> like, what? this is like this is definitely not a conservative show no they have conservative quite conservative storylines and they have they pander to a level of conservatism at times throughout the entire show you know especially in the 60s you think why why <laughs> like this is this is a, a a the whole point of star trek is to is to not be defined by by these things yet yeah, you know they and they did they did a lot about race you know there were a lot of episodes in which they tackled how you know race wasn't a thing they did a lot about the fact that money isn't isn't a problem you know economic issues and things like this but homosexuality and gender and the lgbtq community is just something they didn't really tackle and i you know i i think about you know you mentioned like geordie and i think you mentioned as well bashir in that yes. quite easily you could have had a character like bashir and i i kept thinking about um Odo as well in that I wondered if if you could have had an opportunity where you had a character because because he is he I mean later he has a relationship obviously with Kira but right Odo technically doesn't really have a gender because he's part of a you know he chooses to be a man he chooses based on heavily based on the, the Bajoran scientist who raises him as a child to sort of model himself in the image of Maura Paul the the, the, the doctor so he 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 could he could have been any sex he could have been and, and and I just find that really interesting in that you know could Odo have I mean Odo literally was fluid could he have been fluid you know sex sexually or you know in gender sexually that I mean what do you think I think Odo definitely can can qualify you could see you could make an argument for him being gender fluid absolutely yeah. I actually would make an argument for him being transgender because he is choosing to present himself as male when he can present himself as you said as either um so i mean you can argue for gender fluidity you can argue for transgenderism um and i think that would probably carry over into his romantic preferences but he's always had a thing for kira yeah so it may just be that his sexuality is kira neary's (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah very absolutely yeah just very kira specific uh, yeah which is which is great in itself and, and i don't think i don't think that they made necessarily the wrong choice with odo but i think they could have made a braver choice i mean i, I keep thinking i kept thinking when i was thinking about this i thought you know they the the shapeshifter 
the the bad shapeshifter is very explicitly called the female shapeshifter, and it, and she's cast as Salome Jens, who's a woman, in that role. Yet physically, there is no, there was no necessary reason to make her female. She could have just been the shapeshifter. So I think it was interesting the way they they assigned a gender to that character as well. And they didn't necessarily have to. And maybe now if they made that sort of storyline now, they wouldn't have done. They wouldn't necessarily have assigned a gender. I suspect that they probably have probably wouldn't have. Just mm. given the way that Odo's species, you know, the uh that the way that they are and how they generally exist outside of interacting with solids, quote unquote. You know, I don't see any reason for them to for any of them to have been assigned a gender at that point, you know, but it's all based on what they chose. And in that real sense, you know, it's a matter of respecting their chosen pronouns. And I guess this can go back to that whole pronoun discussion where Odo's pronouns are he, him, because that's what he chooses them to be. You know, the shapeshifters pronouns are she, her, because that's what she chooses them to be. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And, and uh, yeah, I I just look back on this stuff now and I think, yeah, they, they could they could have done this differently had they had a different mindset involved. And I suppose DS9, the one DS epi- uh, DS9 episode that does tackle homosexuality to some extent is rejoined in season four. But I think everyone agreed, even back then, that this was a pretty ham-fisted <laughs> bad attempt <laughs> to try and portray what, on the face of it, at the time would have been called would have been called a lesbian relationship. You know, yes. you know a, a kiss between two women, which I think at the first time that that had, pr- had been seen in a, a, I suppose, an expressly sexual way on Star Trek. However, obviously, that episode comes with the caveat that you're talking about two symbionts that are actually attracted to each other in a sense more than maybe Jadzia and the character of Lenara are. And and that that is that maybe I, I think it, I thought I whenever I watched that and I watched it recently again for this and I hadn't seen it for a long time I think it's a cheat all right and I think that episode cheats <laughs> and, it, and it's trying to get you to I I just think it was there they were trying to court some controversy in the mid nineties I just I don't think there's much substance to it well bear in mind that this is now getting into you know nineteen ninety five and there's a little bit more. Uh, awareness of this type of thing you know um i have to check and see when ellen came out but i believe it was around this time and this was kind of a big deal Mm. you know for you know people to come out and for people to be lesbian and so this was kind of a time to I don't want to say cash and she came out in 97 so it wasn't quite there yet but i don't want to say that that this was a time for them to cash in on this, but it was definitely more in the minds of things. Like we were progressing. We were beginning to see like, you know, their homosexual um, gay re- relationships between men and women. And even though it cheats and even though it's ham fisted, it's still playing it safe because it chose two women. Can you imagine what would have happened if they had had two <laughs> men in that role? That's, that's Yeah, that's very true, actually. And that this is why, you know, I feel like it, it goes a little, it comes a little bit through the, the Rick Berman prism. Like, Rick, Rick, I don't know how much you know about Rick Berman, but he's not exactly the most progressive man in the world. I kind of feel it have gone, oh, Terry Farrell kissing Susanna Thompson. Oh, yes. You know, a little bit. <laughs> do you know, do what, you know I mean? what I mean? And I think the male, fan- male fantasy. That, very, that is absolutely a really good point. I, I feel like this is the way it's sort of put together is that it's all it's all building up to that kiss and i feel like it's i feel like it's quite through the male gaze this episode and i i i understand what they're trying to do and that they're trying to portray a a a a, a relationship between two women but it's not a relationship between two women it's a relationship between a, a, two a, trill to Trill, one of whom was a man and was a woman, and it was it was a it was a traditional re- sexual relationship in that term before, and it just so happens they're both in female bodies now. So I, I feel like that's not it's not about Jadzia finding herself attracted to a woman. It's or- about Dax being attracted to um, to the other Trill, and honestly, that is you're right. It's just that. Using that to kind of have the 
the exploration of a lesbian relationship, again, not terribly well, but using that to have an a exploration of a lesbian relationship was progressive for its time, yeah. Yeah. but also not. I, 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 I mean, I suppose in some ways it, it's good that it's there in that it's getting on screen a relationship that you're supposed to care about. You know, you're not supposed to find them repulsive. You're not supposed to hate them. You know, you're supposed to care that they're two people who are in love and they were separated. And the taboo on Trill is that two symbionts who used to be in a relationship aren't allowed to be in a relationship anymore. So they are, they're booking a very specific, culturally specific taboo but there is that whole conversation, I think, that Kira and Bashir have as outsiders, in which Kira doesn't understand why two people who love each other doesn't matter what you know what they're like now can't be together. And you know, and that is the big metaphor, isn't it? it? You know, the big metaphor for two women being in love: why can't they be together? You know, and that's kind of what this episode, I suppose, in its clumsy way, is trying to say. But I don't know. I just, I just feel like had had it been. I mean, it's better than Meridian, the season before. I don't know if you remember Meridian, where Dax falls in love with that real creep, unlike a, unlike a planet that appears every five minutes, every every sixty years, and then disappears after five minutes. I just don't think it's very good. It's it's not the best episode <laughs> ever produced. I will I will definitely admit that. Is it better than the host though? Because the host is the is the episode that introduces the trill. I have such issues with the host, and I have had issues with the host for years. Not because of the romance with the trill. Not mm. because they stuck the trill in Riker and kind of forced that forced Riker back into that ladies' man, but this time with Beverly, you know, <laughs> sense. But because when he got transported when Odon, that was his name. Yeah, yeah got Odon. Transport, got, got put into his new host, and that host was a woman, that just stopped the relationship dead. Yeah. And it's tracks. Like, and the thing about it that really bothers me today is that it wasn't even a question for audiences at the time that that was, that that would kill the relationship. Like, it was just, oh, Odon's in a woman now. That can happen. Mm. I guess they're not together anymore. And that was so much my issue with that because if they're so much more advanced than we are, I I have real – I mean, it's entirely p- possible that Beverly could just be straight, and I understand that. But I have a real issue with her not being able to at least consider mm that this is the same person, just different. And I mean, even that can be used as a, as a commentary on transgender issues where if someone, you know, transitions from male to female, they're not a different person. They're the same person. And sometimes that in itself can break a relationship, but it's a complicated. And I would say that, that uh, rejoined is a better episode but just because the host, while it was an interesting concept and introduced the trill, did not handle the resulting relationship with Beverly very well. No, it, it paints Beverly in a really bad light, really, because if she's supposed to be a doctor on, on you know, in this futuristic cruise liner where everyone is progressive and she she deals with all kinds of species and has all this knowledge and, and he's, you know, in theory, I would look to the doctor on a ship as being second to the captain as being one of the most progressive, you know, forward thinking, reliable people on a starship, you know, yeah, like, you know, after Picard, it should really be Beverly in many ways. And she's not here. She, as soon as she sees that Odan's in a woman, it's not Odan anymore. And that, and that yes. is, that is awful. That is, that is a really terrible message to send in that, you know, what is the show trying to say that, okay, it was, it felt like the whole episode was just so you could have Jonathan Frakes play a, you know, a sexy trill, who could then charm his way into, Be- you know, to Beverly, and they can have that whole frisson between them, which never would have existed any normally because there's no, they barely ever get any scenes together, let alone attraction. So it's like it just feels very. And at the end, yes, okay, Beverly is is sad and she's crying to Picard, and if anything, that's my favourite moment where Picard doesn't really know how to deal with this because he he clearly loves her in his own way, and he's you know he doesn't really know what to do. But I, I just feel like, it, yeah, it's a really negative, at least rejoined, is trying to 
explore the idea of how the symbionts will transition from male to female in terms of their the, the, the hosts they are in. At least it's trying to explore that idea, whereas the host, oh yeah, it just shuts down the idea that anything that isn't a quote unquote normal male female sexual you know romantic relationship is you know in, and in, and in Star Trek's world in the twenty fourth century, Beverly shouldn't even bat an eyelid. Like like she really shouldn't. You know the whole point of Star Trek, especially the next generation, is that it's this utopia. She didn't shouldn't even think in those, those terms. terms. It, it goes, goes against, against the whole ethos. ethos. Um, and um, that's what bothered me. Even like, and I don't want to say it bothered me as a child, because as a child, I didn't know any better. Yeah. But as I grew older and when I rewatched it, I think in my 20s, I was, I, I thought to myself, why did that end the relationship? There's absolutely no reason for Beverly to just turn away the way she does. And I mean, the way, and I mean, it's definitely the way she turns away from Odon in their new host that kind of gives her, doesn't speak well to her character mm. because she turns away and just kind of almost horror that Odon is now in a female host. And you can just see it on her face that like, this yeah, is yeah. over. And you're like, Oh, come on, Bev. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> you were supposed to passionately fall in love with this man. Although, admittedly, like it happened in days, and I'm always a bit dubious about Star Trek relationships where you know suddenly within days she is like she's forgotten all about everything. And I was like, does he really work that way? You know, he's like just a bit of a Star Trek fantasy. At least this person was alive and not a ghost. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Beverly really has right not direction. had the best luck with uh, with she, lovers. She hasn't. She hasn't. Husband died. Yeah, fell in love with a ghost. That's true. <laughs> That's true. I forgot about that episode. <laughs> um, for, <laughs> maybe for the better. But um, but yeah, I, I it, it isn't it isn't great. And it, I found it interesting though how in both those societies, both in in rejoined and the host in with the trill and with the Jani in in the outcast, they're they're both in both cases. In different ways, it feels like there are quite there are there are sort of autocrats determining how these people can identify and live their lives. So with, with there the absolutely Gen- are with well with the Janae, Gen- you've got the, the, this whole re- ruling legal system that says Soren is not allowed to identify as female, and then she's punished for it. And then with the with the trill, as I say, that taboo is all about how you know you're not allowed to resume a relationship, even if you happen to be. You know, in this case, two women. And it's not as severe as the Janai in what it's saying, but it, it is still there. I found that interesting. And also, they're both scientists. They're both very similar characters, Soren and Lenara. They're both scientists. They're both working on, on similar kind of breakthroughs involving space. And I think in Lenara's case, it's something to do with the wormhole. And with Janai, it's all about this null space. I, in a way, there's a sim- weird... I don't know why that is. There's a weird similarity between them. And I think it might be because it's really easy especially in Star Trek, if you want to have someone come in temporarily, make them a scientist studying something niche because that is always going to eventually take them away to where they have to go to study this thing at the next spot. And I think it might just be for the sake of, again, a result of that episodic format versus a serialized format. Yeah, and I think that's it, isn't it, with with 90 Star Trek. I suppose to finish then... Orion, are we heading in the right direction? Because we've now, in the new series, in the new era of Star Trek, we've got the first uh, homosexual relationship between Stamets and Kolba, which seemed to be falling into the bury your gaze trope. Yeah. Which was an horrible term, but it, you know, and, and, it, and it's, it's subverted that. It's, it's, it's sort of swerved away in the fact that Kolba ended up coming back to life. And it, I, I must say, I've kind of learned a lesson on this because when Culber died in Discovery and he was killed by Ash Tyler, spoilers, by the way, sorry guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked and I thought that was a great moment. I thought it was a really, really good moment for Discovery. It was a shock moment and I, I loved it for that context. And I remember when I heard that Culber was coming back and they were rewriting him back in, I put something on Twitter to say, I've got nothing against Colbra as a character, but I, it's just a shame. It's undercutting that really like interesting shock death. And and on Twitter, Wilson Cruz took 
<laughs> took offence a little bit at what I was saying. He was like, oh, thanks. You want me to stay dead? <laughs> 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 I said, look, Wilson, it's nothing... It's nothing about you. It's nothing against you. Uh, and and so actually, when I started to think about it, I thought actually it is better that you're showing that there might yet be a happy story and a happy ending for these two gay men in 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 a Star Trek series. And I think actually, when I've reflected on it, I think that's better that they did that. It is because there's a whole trope of if you're in a gay relationship, it can never end happily. And yeah. I understand that this kind of flowed from the AIDS epidemic in the eighties and nineties, where a lot of these gay relationships were tragically cut short Mm -hmm. due to, you know, the partners getting HIV. So there's a lot of that in the barrier gay trope, but to have a gay relationship flourish and be loving. And even though it was cut short to have him come back, and to have them continue to be happy, that's actually huge. It shows that there can be a happy ending for a gay couple, just like for a straight couple. Yeah. You know, and I think what they did was honestly really good with that. Yeah, I I, I think that now, actually. I've really rethought my my, my uh my thought process on that, definitely. I think I think you're right. What do you what do you reckon about Seven of Nine then as well? Because at the end of Picard we get a suggestion that she might be in a relationship with Rafi, which is something they might well pursue in season two. I think Seven's going to be a regular in season two. So, and, and obviously she had a relationship with Bajazzle, the, the crime right. syndicate lady. There's also her whole implied relationship with Chakotay as well. Right, exactly. So does I'm a, does that mean that, I mean, that in my mind, that suggests that Seven is bi or that she always was and that maybe, or it's something. And I, th- I thought that was... It, did, it didn't necessarily need to be part of the character, but I don't think it, it was a problem in any way. I think it was interesting the way they looked at Seven and they thought, okay, well, maybe she could go down this road. Well, after Seven was introduced in Voyager as a sex symbol, and let me tell you, as a young assigned female at birth girl at the time, that was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> But after they kind of brought Seven on as a sex symbol, it it could only have served to broaden her character to make her bi instead of just stereotypically straight. Um, The only other thing I think, I think honestly, if they had created Seven today, she might have been aromantic or asexual just from her time in the Borg, and that's Mm. fine. But I think having her as bisexual and actually exploring those relationships as well is also a really good thing. I think it, it could it could end up being a really interesting story if they if they do go that direction with her and Rafi in season two. I suppose it, it is signs that Star Trek is moving with the times on this, that it's not paying lip service like it did in the 90s with episodes like The Outcast or Rejoined. And it's actively trying to show that in the future, these kind of relationships are are there. And they're, you know, they're not they're not in any way... You know, the, the great thing about Stamets and Colbert is that I don't, for me, it's never, it's ne- there's never really been anything in it that suggested that them being gay is a, is a, any kind of point. They just are a couple. And I think I really like that about them as characters. I, I think that, well, I don't want to say that Star Trek Next Generation paid lip service. I think it tried in the best way it could at the time. But Star Trek has always been a lens into the ideal, into what could be. And it's always done that for the audience it's it's playing to. You know, in the sixties this dealt mostly with race. It dealt it was with it was by having Uhura and uh and Sulu on the bridge. Mm. You know, it was showing that we could that a black woman could be equal. It was showing that a Japanese man could be, you know, could work together with Americans. This was, you know, definitely post World War II, where a lot of that sentiment was still there. Mm. And going into Next Generation, you know, you have Worf on the bridge now, so it shows that old enemies, you know, using Worf as an analog, I guess, for Russia. Um, yeah. And Chekhov was good for that too, as well. I can't forget him. <laughs> um, Walter, I, I would be doing Walter Keonik a huge disservice by forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was great as Bester in, in Babylon was, Five. Don't get was. me wrong, but he was amazing. But he got his start as Chekhov, and he did Chekhov really well, well into 
his middle age. So, so then we had Worf, you know, kind of on the bridge and next generation to show that, you know, yes, we are moving forward and Worf moving forward with that too. And to DS9 was great. But Star Trek has always been about preaching the possible and preaching the ideal. And it has always been about challenging us to be a better, a better version of ourselves as a society, mm-hmm. I think. And I think we're still, I think Trek is still doing that with its represent, with its interpersonal representations of gay relationships, with making seven of nine visibly part of the LGBT community. It, it is definitely still challenging us, not to mention, you know, Picard's kind of commentary on society, on his society, you know, in that, and that series regressing in terms of the way they, they view um, synthetic life forms, I guess is the way you could put it. Mm. There is definitely Trek kind of pushing us to say, you know, Hey guys, be better. And in that sense, it's definitely still moving us forward. I think even now. And that's great. And that, that is something that in these, you know, fairly tense political days that we still are, you know, look, yeah, we're looking in the right direction with representation, with gender. And um, yeah, I would just say to anyone, it, go back and watch The Outcast because it's it's a bit of a surprise. <laughs> so like it may well may well surprise you in, in more ways than one. So yeah, if, uh, if listening to this is uh, worth anything, it's definitely checking that out. So Orion, thanks for coming on and helping me, um, you know, discuss this, a topic that, uh, you know, I've I've... I've worked with the LGBTQ community in the past. I've worked with people who are trans and I, 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 I really want people to know more about this. I'm still learning and, you know, really see it in Star Trek and see Star Trek reflected. So thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. Topic it is absolutely today. my pleasure, Tony. It, it was, it was a joy for me. I love talking about Star Trek and about, you know, just how it relates to our society at large and our lives. So this was perfect. You're blended already.